coming in June. Hi, it's Dr. G. And after two plus years and about 140 episodes of hosting the Menopause Movement podcast, I've had a revelation. You know, this podcast is about more than just menopause. We talk about mindset, building wealth, creating habits, discussing life hacks, and so much more. So it's time to move forward from menopause and into being more. As you've probably heard me say many times, menopause is not a medical condition that requires treatment. It's the privilege of a long life and it gives us the opportunity to launch something new. To that end, I wanna help in more ways than just menopause. Welcome to the Launch Your Life with Dr. G podcast. It's the only mindset podcast that provides weekly actionable insights for lasting happiness and change specifically created for high achieving professionals who are ready to bounce back and prevent burnout. We're still gonna have awesome guests. We'll still talk about the menopause things that, that women wanna know about, but we're gonna focus on mindset. Now why, you might be asking. You know, because we live our entire lives in our minds and the faster and more efficiently we can make it a happy place, the better our lives will be. Life is a series of adventures and we can launch our next phase and create 1% for improvements together. I'm honored to be on this journey with you and I can't wait to bring you all of the awesome guests for this new podcast. Well, welcome back to the Menopause Movement Podcast. We've got Deirdre Fay joining us today. Deirdre is a licensed clinical social worker, the author of Attachment-Based Yoga and Meditation for Trauma Recovery, co-author of Attachment Dis Disturbances in Adults. I didn't get a chance to read it. I got a chance to skim it, and it looks very, very intense. It's a, it's a psychology textbook, which is, which is in and of itself a, a, a chore uh, for me anyway. <laughs> and, uh, well, I try and, to simplify. And yeah. yeah. Right. And then uh, the author of a Becoming Self, so Safely Embodied Skills Manual. She's, uh, let's see what else we have here. Well, the BSE, the Becoming Safely Embodied Skills are now used around the world by individuals and uh, groups and therapists and teachers. They're just really succinct, little, simple skills to help people actually live in their body instead of just thinking about their lives that's, and getting caught in the ruminations. Oh, that's great. So a couple other things. The book, the book uh, Attachment Disturbances in Adults won a bunch of awards. I saw that on, um, <clears throat> on Amazon and it was like in, in 2017 or something, it won like the highest award that you can get in a textbook, right? Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. And in the field of trauma and attachment. Right? In the field of trauma and attachment. So, so this is interesting. Simple skills. So one of this book is used to help people get some tools to manage their trauma and their wounding and to live in their skin. And that's, that's an interesting thing because I have, I have a, some trauma in my background that we can get into. She lived for six and a half years in a yoga ashram where she learned the profound practices of uh, meditation and body presence. And that's, uh, that's cool. So Deirdre, I'm, I'm happy to have you here. I'm just trying to see if there's anything else we want to say. Uh, she marries contemporary thought with ancient wisdom traditions and allows people to access what feels true to them while having harmonious relationships. And she's got a quiz that you can take. It's called what's your relationship profile. And we'll link that up in the show notes. So, um, I'm excited to have you here. It's, uh, it's, it's, this is really, really great because, you know, we're, we're women going through menopause. And one of the things I think that happens to us as we age and go through menopause is we start to get to a point of like, is this all? I was talking about this on one of my Facebook lives recently. Is this all there is? And what's next for me? And that was, you know, something that happened for me. And when I, one of the stories I like to tell people is I, I had spent all this time and energy getting through my surgical residency. And it was like the main focus. And even like the energy healers would come to me and say, man, you've got a horn in the front of your head because, you know, because I was, um, I was just really focused. And when I started my practice, I, I remember there was a distinct, I have this emotional memory of just sitting in my office saying, well, I'm not happy. It didn't, it didn't happen. Why, why am I not happy? And is this all there is? And, um, and so f helping to find meaning was, was really important for me. 
In terms of relationship and attachment, I'd like to hear from you, like what what that means, especially since, you know, like like many of us, by the time we've reached this age, we've been through at least one divorce and some multiple divorces or multiple relationships. I'd like to I'd like to hear from you about about let's 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 start with with uh, how you got how you got into attachment and what that means. It's a big subject, so let me condense. So when I was living at the yoga, yoga ashram, it was such a safe environment. It was, a, it was a wonderful cocoon of safety, living with all these people, 300 and some odd people, uh, in a really safe environment, doing a lot of spiritual practice. And during that time, it's just what spiritual practices are supposed to do. They opened up all that was unfinished in me. And that uh-huh. happened to be my own trauma history, which I had kind of, uh, compartmentalized off, dissociated from it, didn't really think it had its impact on me. So that just came flooding to the surface. And so that became my work. I started looking at this and working and went to school then worked with Bessel van der Kolk in his clinic. How do you put all these great wisdom tradition practices into experience when your, your body is shot and you're overwhelmed and you're triggered all the time? And so I really started working at that really basic level. And then I hey, wait, wait, wait. What what basic level? I'm I'm already lost. So oh, good for me to slow down. So let's say, and this doesn't have to be from a trauma trigger. Whenever we're triggered, what happens? Our whole body goes right, and we're lost in it. We're completely captivated by what that trigger is. So so let's just talk about triggers for a second because I like this is like, well, it's almost like a new a new concept for me. And how I think, so? how come it's a new concept? Yeah, tell me about um, that. Because I've, I never really heard that term. So maybe it's a, maybe it's a big term in the psychology circles. And I think it's also big now with millennials. It's a big, it, you know, you hear it, hear it from the millennials. And I can think of many instances where I was triggered and reacted inappropriately because one of the ways that I managed my own trauma was to not, you know, not to uh, trust anyone and to always push people away. And and then if I felt threatened at all, I would just, I would just lash out. Right. That was, that was one of my, my, th- and, and, and as I've grown up, I've, I've realized that, but it took me, I mean, you know, <laughs> I almost lost my job when I was a resident because I, because I, I didn't know how to interact with people. You know, so so this is like you know going back to the the trauma of my childhood and not really learning the the coping skills that that were necessary, and and it's probably it's probably common, you know, and and not and and you know thankfully I got to a place where I had the luxury to do some self, you know, introspection, uh, where a lot of women may not have that because we're you know many many people are still in survival mode even even into menopause. So, so just to talk about, you know, what a trigger is, I mean, let's just define that to start. Well, a trigger can be two things. It can be you're either overreactive, like lashing out, or you're collapsing in and withdrawing. Okay. And that's where the beautiful connection between attachment theory is, because attachment styles are based, I hate to say it, just on those very simple things. If you have a safe enough relationship, you're going to feel safe to go out into the world because you know that when something happens, because something will happen, that you have safe people to return to that are going to be soothing and reassuring and calming and let you know the world's okay. So that's the basic of a secure attachment. But what the research shows across the Western world is that one out of four people has a secure attachment. Well, what does that mean? That means that the rest of us don't. So, all right. So let's define secure, secure attachment. Come back to it. Well, what I say is that there are seven fundamental attachment needs. There. Okay. Knowing that you're safe, knowing that you're safe with other people, safe in your own skin. So that's one. Feeling, knowing that you can be, get reassurance and calming, having somebody attuned to you, knowing that you can attune to other people, be aware of them. It's an empathic skill. Being able to be empathic and attuned to your own inner, what's going on inside your own body mm-hmm. instead of avoiding it. Knowing about guidance and mentoring, being able to have somebody who can take you through small, simple steps, being able to be able to be with conflict and repair the conflict so the relationship gets stronger over time and doesn't fall apart. Mm. Having ease of well-being in the body or with people or with life, Um, not taking life personally. These are all some of the simple attachment 
needs that we all have. And if we don't have them met, that's where things get messy. But when, when things don't get repaired, we get disrupted inside. Now, it, it's one thing for you and I, and menopausal women, right, to, to be able to think about things and reflect on it. But if you're a youngster and these attachment styles are laid down before we're three years old, before we have uh, capacity to narrate our life, it's just a felt experience. So when it's laid down that low, that young, then it gets encoded as body memory, Mm -hmm. felt experience, and not, it's not cognized. And so one of the things that happens is as we're growing up, we kind of push away all those sensations that don't make sense or we don't know what to do with or are overwhelming, and we build a self on top of that. But then we feel split inside. We're like, why? Why is this happening? How come life doesn't fit the way I want, right? Yeah. Part of what you're describing, what I describe, it's just life. And so part of our task is being able to be attuned to ourselves so that we can make sense of our inner world and put the pieces back together and then choose how we want to be in this, in this life, in this time, in this relationship. And that's what gets complicated. But if we, if we, I'll draw you a little, if we think about triggers, this is what seems to make the most sense for people. So here we are in say 2019. So we all have memories. Now, this is not how memory is actually encoded in, in the mind or in the body. But here we are doing our regular thing. And we've got all this stored stuff. Now, some of this stored stuff is really highly charged. And so when we're here and somebody says, gosh, Michelle, why, why did you do that? And you have, as much as hard as you work, a lot of stuff down here in the past it's like charged when this happens in 2019 it's going to immediately associate not even nanoseconds yeah and if this is so charged and unable to be contained this is going to pop it to you know the word sounds so it explodes into this present moment in 2019 and we think it blows up in 2019 and we're no longer thinking, oh, there's a nice past experience. No, mm. it's all happening now and we get crazy. Does this, Why? so are you saying that, that, okay, so just, just so I understand, are you saying that, that this can be something that we've hidden from ourselves that all of a sudden we're remember, remembering uh, because of uh, some sort of a, an experience that, you know, obviously triggers it, but brings something that's been really, really pushed down into the surf, up to the surface. Is that what you're saying is happening? And so what was something that maybe our psyches have pushed down as a, as a protection mechanism? And then all of a sudden, either through a a positive where, where we've been working, like what happened with you at the ashram or through a negative, somebody pushing us in a way that's uncomfortable, these memories are coming up. Is it always is it always memories or can it be? Well, it's like we, we we think about memories as something that we can cognize and understand. But what if it's just like this felt oozing, you know, mm-hmm. this like sense of like I have a lot of people say I wake up in the morning and I'm um, really anxious or depressed. But why? When you wake up in the morning, there's nothing has changed, right? Except that you're tapping into a state. So often it's really helpful for people to reflect on what was, what, when you're waking up in that state, what's that anxiety? You have to link it back. You have to, uh, you have to, it's like a big puzzle piece. You have to sure. put things together. How, where does this, where would this have felt like this before? In the morning. In the morning. Usually it's, it, there's some similarity, but sometimes it doesn't have to be. Oh, I see. Know? You have to play around in the field, and it's it's more of an art than a science. It's not like there's anything specific, but something will rise to the surface. I see. Now, not to go too far off track, but this is where the beautiful intersection with the ancient wisdom traditions are, is because they say that consciousness is clean and clear, but that we have these imprints on us. And what we're imprinted with stays with us, and it stays with it as a thought, a body sensation, um, an interaction of some kind. So when it ch- this is so that's in the spiritual world. But if we think about it from an attachment perspective, if somebody has a, a mother or father or caregiver that doesn't attune to them and lets them cry by themselves, 
that leaves us an impression in our system. And it's out of those simple little things that we build what's called a representation. It's how we then see the world. And that lens that we see the world then um, kind of predetermines how our relationships in life will be. And the research is that if for uh, many teenagers, I think it's 77% of teenagers, those early attachment representations, those impressions on our system, actually live out later in life. Like 77%. If you have this attachment, uh, you're going to have that later in life. Unless you change it. Right, right. But that, that requires... That requires some some deep inner work to change it. Yeah, I, you know, I guess that's true. I, I, I want to say I, I want to avoid the word deep only because I don't want it to make it so scary for people. It's sure. Like, it, it is, it's a process and it is a, a system, but we can change. Yeah. Well, so so I just want to make an example. So one of the things I learned, actually, I was at one of the James Wedmore's uh, conferences. Uh, back in April. And one of the things that he said really, really struck me, you know, and it was, if you, if you were traumatized as a child and you're still living as a victim, are you going to let a child run your life for the rest of your life? And I, I was like, you know, and, and I had worked, I mean, I was, I was really brutally sexually traumatized as a child. And, um, and I've talked about this a lot and, and, um, in my Facebook lives and it's going to come out in my, in my uh, memoir that's, that's hopefully going to come out in May, but it, and it's, I was brutalized. It was so brutal that I, there's a whole year of my life. I don't remember. I actually have a physical memory of waking up and, and fifth grade. And so what, what I find, uh, fascinating about that was that, you know, I worked through it and I realized that, you know, one of the main things for me was forgiveness and, the for, that forgiveness was for me, you know, and, and it didn't matter, you know, what those other people, whether they accepted my forgiveness or not, that, that I was going to get free of them from that. But it's easy to kind of get stuck in this whole feeling of, uh, uh, you know, victimhood and think that, you know, you're doing, I, I, like, I was like, I'm doing this because this, 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 and this happened to me when I was little. And, to to get to a point where like you know what i'm responsible for my own actions it has nothing to do with what that this guy or that guy or maybe that priest i, I don't remember um <laughs> did to me it has to do with you know how i just choose to take my life going forward right um and and what's really funny um you know i'm a surgeon right i have a surgical practice i employ three other surgeons besides myself and a support team of about seven or eight uh, maybe more. And um, I've always felt like a chronic underachiever. <laughs> so this, this is, I'm probably a perfect, perfect candidate. Underachiever, it's down in here. Probably. Yeah. And what happens is we don't link these two together. You know, so we live these, what I call parallel lives here. You're doing all what you're doing. Pretty amazing stuff. And here it's like, Oh my God, I'm not good enough. I'm not whatever it is. Mm -hmm. it. Run it. And, this part is living this way instead of interacting. And so the task really is how do we stay here, access this, dip our toe into this, make sense of it, and help this part see through eyes, our eyes here. And that, that starts changing things. Right. So, so when you do that, so that's, is that, and that's what you do through your programs. That's what I do with everything. That's what I do with myself. It's a constant practice because we're retraining and this is what i love about the wisdom traditions they talk about training the mind not just the mental mind but the heart mind right uh, right ourselves to move in the direction we want to go rather than being overwhelmed by it so so would you say that that one of the key components to getting i guess free of triggers or 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 understanding um ourselves is like some sort of a spiritual practice um, well, I think I don't, from my point of view, there's not much difference between life and spiritual practices. <laughs> you know, okay. Life is exactly this. Life is, in yoga, we talk about how there's, I mean, what has an acorn turn into an oak tree, right? It's that life force energy. Mm -hmm. So that life force energy is streaming through us all the time. It has no choice. That's what it does. <laughs> right. But it hits up against these blocks, these little, what I call time capsules in us. So when, when we get activated inside, 
we're getting hit with, in yoga, we call it a samskar. The life force is coming up and hitting the samskar. And the life force's only goal is to bring us freedom, to bring us home to ourselves. So that life force is coming up and hitting the samskar and saying, honey, I, I just want to clean this out of the way. I want you to be free. But we're in that samskar, in that one. We're like, ah, I'm 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 certain that many many of my of my followers will 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 relate to that because it's so easy to it's no it's just so easy to yeah I mean life life happens and it can be so messy you know and then we go "Ah," and so we push up against it And, and the thing is is that you know I do talk a lot so so I had this whole period in my life where I was like atheist slash agnostic and uh last year the year before i read autobiography of a yogi oh cool and it changed everything for me and so now i mean like i don't know if you've seen my facebook lives but i've put so i'm going through the self realization fellowship lessons and i get one of these every two weeks and uh this this one this this is lesson 6 and it's all about movement to like get the life force going and it's like like 36 or 38 movements that like are supposed, it's supposed to help move the energy. I don't know. I, 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 you know, whatever, but, but what I find. (laughs) It's really, it can be really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. But what I find really fascinating for me is that, you know, I've never really liked yoga. I think yoga hurts. You know, I've got, I, I, I'm overweight. So I've got a big belly. I have to breathe against it and, and it's frustrating, you know? And, and so, so it's, it's interesting to hear Yogananda talk about this Kriya yoga, right? Like, what is that? What is that? I want to know that. I want to have that connection with God so that, you know, and not, not so much that I want to have superpowers because I don't care about superpowers. I just want to feel secure. Exactly. And so what I do. And at ease. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I do in my, in my meditation is I'm like, okay, God, reveal yourself. And so the other day I I had a brief glimpse and it was really weird. I was like, my eyes were closed and all of a sudden it was like looking through, uh, you know, like a, a forest of bamboo into a light. And it was like that. And then I came right back because I was like, Oh, what is that? Right. You know, so, so it, and, but, but the point is, and this is what I, you know, I try to tell people is like, you know, a spiritual practice is going to set you free. And, and even if you don't believe, even if you don't believe in God or a super force or something, there is energy. And we know the quantum physics it explains that we're, you know, we're, everything is constantly moving and all we, ha- if we can get into the right vibra- vibration, anything is available to us. Right. And, and so, you know, what I, what I like to say is if you don't believe in a God or, or a supreme being or energy, whatever, if you just sit for 20 minutes with your eyes closed and focus on your breathing, everything is going to calm down for you. It doesn't matter because it's going to, it's going to, you know, get your nervous system better, you know? So, so I guess the next question I would have for you is, you know, how do we, how do we look at our, you know, I mean, we've talked about triggers now, so let's, let's talk about what are, I guess, attachments, right? So, so attachments, I mean, are you talking about like, you know, the, the two, sep- you know, the, the two phases of separation where we're really attached to our parents and then, or. No, when we talk about attachment representations, uh, the research, and this is like the gold standard everywhere is um, that there are four main attachment styles and one is a secure, you know, where you much think about it you can just let life roll off your back you're at ease in the world you feel secure in yourself um then there's the ones that the attachment style that i call permeable in the literature we call it anxious or preoccupied it's all about i got to figure out what's going on out there so that i work it out make it all okay out there so that i feel good and that's like the control freak well, they can be, we can control in many different ways. I can try to control you out there and control the circumstances of life out there because I don't feel safe inside myself. Okay. The other style would be somebody that's dismissive or uh, we call it more contained. Somebody that's like, okay, I'm not going to get involved. I've got, I'm okay by myself. I don't need anybody. I'm fine. 
Um, but what that person loses out on is the interconnection, you know, the relationships. And for some reason, this person keeps pushing people away and people get upset or feel rejected or dismissed or made wrong. So those are the two extremes. And then there's a thir- uh, fourth style called the disorganized attachment, which is all over the place. It can be multiple things. And what we also see is, depending on where you are on the spectrum, this part here might be dismissive. And this part here might be anxious. So it depends on what part is taking over the scene. Sure. Now, some of us have a more predominant style and some of us have um, a mixture. The whole idea of being free is being able to stay more in 2019 or this current present moment. Being able to say like, wow, look at how that part is like taking over the show here. Man, is this what I want? Who do I want to be right now? Okay. Yeah. So so we talk a lot about... Um, you know, how you can't fail the present moment, you know, how, how, the, actually in this yeah, it, it, you know, you cannot fail now, you know, you can, it, there's, there's things are going to happen, you know, they're good things or bad things. We don't know, but if you can stay, and it's hard, you know, every once in a while you can get, you get into this flow where you can be present and then it's, and then, and then what happens is you can actually learn to become the observer, but you know, it's, it's, it's hard. You know, the, the Michael Singer book, right? Have you read it? Um, yeah, he taught us back in the day. The like, untethered soul, you know, right. like who, who, who is listening to the voice, right? And, um, and so, it, it, and, and Adi Ashanti, who, who wrote a book called um, uh, Pure Meditation, right? True, true meditation. And when you, when you really get down to what, what it is, is just like awareness, Right. And that's our connection with the cosmic consciousness. And then, and then it starts to get really weird. And, and then I start to feel like, oh, I'm thinking um, like a philosopher and I don't like how I feel when I, you know, when I think that way. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a really, it's a really interesting place to be in, in, in trying to understand ourselves. Right. I mean, that that's what this is all about. I mean, we're, we're all in a, in a place where, you know, we come from, wherever we come from into these bodies. And the goal is to, you know, kind of reconnect with God. At least that's what Yogananda said, right? You know, we're, we're, we're on this, this quest to reconnect with God. And if we want to do this self-discovery, um, getting to a point where we can see what all these things mean. Does that make sense? Am I making any sense at all? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You know, to go back to your meditation where you saw this light and then you pulled back. Yeah. Well, practices, spiritual practices are all designed to do is to ease ourselves and calm our system so that when we reach those moments, we, instead of retracting and freezing, we go into it. Yeah. And that going into it is the process of letting go over and over and over again in our daily life so that when that happens, we can be one. Yoga is about becoming one with all that is. Yeah. So, I was like, oh, how can we sink into that moment? Yeah, it was, it was really, um, different. And, and I think because I was like, one of the things that Yogananda says in the very first lesson, he says, you know, you need to go after God, like a drowning man goes after a buoy, right? right. Reveal right. yourself, reveal yourself. And so then I finally, I, it was like, Oh, I finally got it. Ah! <laughs> It, it's kind of funny. I mean, I was super, super religious as a teenager. I, I was like in the born again Christian, you know, um, thing. And, and, um, we, and in the eighties, it was really weird because we, we would like pray for people. And then like, I had, my phone was disconnected from the wall and was still ringing. And we had some really like weird supernatural stuff happen back in the eighties. And, um, and, and it's funny because my friend Naomi uh, said, you know, I want an explanation for those times because it was, I mean, it was like really weird, psychically, spiritually strange times. And then I kind of let it all go because I had to come to grips with the fact that I am a lesbian. And when I was in the, when the Christian religion, you know, I was w- with them, you know, that was not okay. And I actually did, I went through a whole ex-gay, you know, thing and, um, it was, you know, but it was, it was really a hard lesson for me to, to have to go through. And that, and so I, I kind of rejected all Christianity because of this belief that the Christians 
put. But now that I understand a little bit better that religion is really the the people trying to control other people and it isn't really the spiritual person, you know. So so what else what else can we can we how can we help, you know, if somebody's like noticing that they're getting triggered and maybe not necessarily through a you know, a meditation, but maybe by through an interaction with their spouse or something, how, how can we help them improve their relationship? Gosh, there's so many steps. So one is being able to step back from the moment, you know, be the observer. Yeah. Just, I can remember once being really triggered and walking for an hour, just saying this, I'm just triggered. I'm triggered. I'm triggered. Just naming it. We know from the research that being able to name something, we call it mindfulness as well. It helps uh, externalize and create calmness. So just being able to name it, okay, I'm triggered. Don't make it about the content. Just say, I'm triggered. I'm triggered. Take a break. Let your nervous system calm down. Mm -hmm. Do any kind of technique. Go for a run. Take a deeper breath. You know, punch a bag. Whatever helps you just diffuse your energy. That's key. Step away from it. It's not about now. And one of the things I say to people, if it's this bad now, Just imagine what it was like back then when that activation, that representation was imprinted on you. You're feeling it now when you have all the resources and capabilities you do now, but you you didn't have it back then. So you're getting a glimpse, a tiny little window into how bad it was for us back in the day and why we had to shut it all down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That that brings in a lot of self-compassion. It's like, oh, my God. Yeah. So that brings perspective and all these things help to slow down the trigger and give some room. And then if you can, you can talk about it, but if you can't take some time, write about it, draw about it, um, dance it out. Try to, what is it in there that's creating havoc? It's not about there as much. We only want to make it out there. We have all the, our favorite tendencies, blaming, criticizing, judging, every, everything's wrong out there, but the reality is it's in here that's activated. Right. Well, I think also, I think also one of the, one of the big techniques and and something that has really helped me is to realize that those are just thoughts, right? Those are not our identity. They're not who we are. And I like to tell my, my uh, followers and people that one of the, one of the best techniques is something that I learned from Sri Kumar Rao, which is the pause. And it's just 10 deep breaths. So when, when you start to feel that coming on, you take 10 deep breaths and what that's going to do is it's it's just going to calm your nervous system and give you a break. Right. You know, but we talk a lot about <clears throat> about identity and who we really are. And um, you know, if if you, and, and what what happens is we're so body centric and we're so mind centric and once we start to realize that there's more than just the the thoughts that we have and the and the body that we are, then um then we can we can move forward and and you know, when, when you have a belief, a belief is just a sentence that you say over and over and over in your head. Right. And, um, and once, once we realize that, that everything that we believe can change, it's just a story. Right. Um, and, and, and I, and what, what happened for me and one of the things that was very helpful for me was that, okay, so I was a little girl and I was abused And that little girl did whatever she could to protect herself. But that's not me now. And that, and I don't have to work from that hurt little girl because now I'm an adult who can see it objectively. Now I'm not going to say that I don't suffer from it because, you know, when, when, you know, with sexual abuse, it's, it's hard to have a normal adult sexuality, you know, life when that happens, but, but some people get through it. But, but so I'm not going to say that I'm, I'm through it all because, you know, I'm, I've, got stuff to work on too. I'm never, it's never going to go away, but, um, but I can at least see it as, you know, that little girl did whatever she could to stay away. And, and what I find really fascinating is that the whole idea was to push down my spirit. I had, I had so much spirit. I was always so, you know, as the one who got back on the horse, I was one who got up when you pushed me down and it's almost I don't know, you know, I wonder who I would be if it hadn't happened, because I have so much tenacity and so much perseverance that, you know, I will, I will work at anything until it's done. I will just, I I mean, I just keep going like a dog with a bone. 
<laughs> and and you know, and, and it's kind of funny because if if you, did you see Tony Robbins' um, Netflix special? No. All right. So on that Netflix special, the I am not your guru, he says, you know, I had a bad childhood, but I'm so grateful for that because it made me the man I am. And so I'm almost there. I don't know if I can say that I'm, I'm grateful for the fact that I was brutalized, but I'm great. I'm thankful that I don't remember it all now, you know, if I were to remember it all and, and I might before I die and I might not, but it, you know, I, I think that it would be, it would be a traumatic, right? you know? So for anybody else who's like that, like, like there, there are plenty of women who follow me who have, I mean, when you look at the statistics, it's, it's one out of four and probably closer to one out of two girls who are, or any, any, you know, women who, who are sexually molested in this country and maybe even throughout the world. So for, for somebody who has, um, you know, something like me, like, you know, has a repressed memories or anything like that, what. What are your recommendations for that? You've already said some of them. <laughs> you know, the, I think in my office, what I see the most is that learning how to separate out the past from the present, being able to stay in this moment, identify with this moment. And even when I've worked with the most severely dissociated and in a group and had them name, what, how do you know when you're in the present moment? They actually can name it, you know. Okay. Talk about seeing things you know, in perspective, not having black and white thinking, they, they feel a sense of ease and well-being. They naturally know that state. But the other stuff, that's where this model comes in so helpful, this parallel lives, is these states occlude. They keep us from seeing the present moment. But when you begin to separate that out and say, oh, here I am in this moment, pausing, slowing down, doing whatever we can to walk away from the activation, that helps the body calm. Then you have more perspective and sure. then you can choose knowing that the past is invading the present is a key thing, both in attachment work and in trauma. When you know that this past is coming in, then you can say, okay, wow, that's happening. How do I move away? So those there, are key things. There's a book I read. I started reading. I don't think I finished it by David R Richo. I think when the past, when the past is present. Mm -hmm. oh, I haven't read that one, right? Yeah, but he wrote a really good book called How to Be an Adult in Relationships. And exactly. and uh, there's like five, you know, pillars of, of how to be an adult in a relationship. And um, I was, you know, Hal Elrod wrote this book called The Miracle Morning, right? And so I read that book several years ago. And part of my morning routine of uh, when I was doing Miracle Morning was to read a book for 20 minutes. That was part of the deal. And so I read this really hard book, this how to be an adult in relationship 20 minutes at a time, because man, that that's a tough, have you, have you read that book? Yeah. Yeah. But it's, the reason it's hard, it's, it's bringing up all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And then he wrote this book out when the past is present. And I thought, you know, that might be helpful for me. And then I just, you know, I could be an adult and read this book. <laughs> but I, I just, I didn't finish it, but you know, one of the things is, is that I've found there's, there's a couple of things I want to go into, but one, one thing that I found that if you have a hard book, so I'll just give this little tip. If you have a hard book, the way to do it is to read it and, you know, take, take like set a timer 10 or 15 minutes and read and then stop. And then, I mean, it took me, it probably took me three months to read that book, but I would have never read it otherwise. Right. And it was a really helpful book, but I wanted to go back and talk to you for a second about dis dissociation or dissociative behavior and, and kind of what that means, because remember, my audience is not medical and it's not uh, psychology, you know, for the most part, it's just, you know, ladies living their lives. And so I, I want to understand what what that means, what what dissociative, what dissociation is and and what brings it on and that sort of thing. Well, we have typical dissociation. You know, if I'm busy, my mind is crazy and I go downstairs and I, where did I put that? Happened the other day. I went to the massage therapist. I didn't know my check. I thought I brought the check. Where did I? Oh my God. Where did I? That's a, just a simple everyday dissociation. That's not brain fog. It sounds like brain you fog. It sounds like a menopause symptom. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole spectrum of dissociation from the very ordinary. Yeah. To what you described earlier on when you woke up and you said, oh my God, I finally woke up. There was something you said. Yeah, I was in fifth grade when I woke up. I'm like, what happened last year? Right, exactly. Yeah. So what happened last year? So that's on the further end of dissociation. 
when we think about, you know, there's many ways that can show up where we literally forget we did something or some part of us takes over and did something that we don't know about. So there's all that whole spectrum. Okay. But the more we normalize it, really all it's trying to do is dissociation is trying to help us cope with life. And there's a good way to do it. Like you're being able to, and all of us being able to put our stuff in the past and say, I'm not going to deal with it right now. That's dissociation. Not bad. But what do we do later on? Do we incorporate it? Do we bring it back and do we link it back up? Like even if you're reading a book that's hard, during that 20 minutes, read a little bit. When you feel your body get activated, slow down, write what's activating, what's going on in here. Not just in the book. Start naming and labeling what's going on in here. And doing this process of disidentifying, I am not that. Because when we get activated, our nervous system takes over and we're like, oh my God, this is me. It's uh, uh, right. Right. Changing our identity to, yeah. Flip right there. So our task is, okay, wow, it's not happening now. This is, you know, that act, this is a trigger. I'm activated. Let me yeah. see what I can find out about that rather than being the trigger. So, in terms of like recognizing when we're triggered, what do you think is the best skill that we could give our audience today? to recognize what's happening. I mean, like what a trigger is or, you know, and how to see and, and then, and then give like, like I'd like to give, you know, the women who are watching and the men um, <laughs> tools that, that like when they, because, because this may be the very first time that they're actually seeing, this may be like a huge aha for a lot of women about, oh my God, this is what's been happening like for the last 30 years. Right. So what's some tool that we can give them number one, to recognize how, um, you know, how they're being triggered. And number two, just a tool to kind of come back into who they are. Let me give you another little drawing then. Great. If we, um, what we're trying to do always is we live within what we call it a window of tolerance. This is the research of Dan Siegel. Okay. Um, if we live in this window of tolerance, then we can deal with whatever goes through here, right? But let's say uh, we're, we get activated or something bad happened. We literally start narrowing that window. We live in a smaller and our task is actually to open up that window of tolerance, to be able to tolerate way more than we could back here. Yeah. How to become an adult, this is really the process of being an adult. And if we have good enough caregiving, somebody's going to be there, oh, honey, that it's all right. It's just a dream. It's just a dream. You can go back to sleep. Calming and reassuring. I'm like, oh, I can handle it. We can let life roll through us. Now, if we can't, when something happens, we're like, like here, right? We're all freaked out. Well, yeah. how do we get ourselves back? We have to breathe, slow down, enter this. And then over time, we take, we get activated. We reach this little level. And we think, okay, how? I'm triggered. I'm activated. This is horrible. I want to get back in here. I want to get into this optimal zone. Or if I'm shut down, how do I like, okay, I need a break. I need to just come back in here. So there's many ways that people do it, but this is an ideal way of looking at it. So, but it starts with awareness. Right. It starts with awareness. And, and, and I think one of the best ways to learn how to become aware is to actually take the time to meditate or to sit. Slow down. Journal. Yeah. Madeline Langle used to say the best thing we can do is just keep a daily journal. Just write, write, write. You are then observing what's going on in life. That's true. Meditation yeah. is a great thing, but if you can't slow it down, I'm going to be doing a course in the fall we call Living Untriggered, you know, looking at the four components of meditation, self-compassion, mindfulness, being able to concentrate, being able to be with non-duality, be with nothingness, and know that we're all one. But that piece about concentration, if I'm triggered up, I need to be able to go where I want to go instead of being pulled by all these pieces. So I have to cultivate that capacity to focus. You had that early on. That's a native quality of yours. You yeah. came into this lifetime with that. That's easy for you. For many people, it's not. It's, yeah. So, so what, tell me more about your course that you're teaching. Uh, we well, teach a bunch of them, but the one that's coming up will be Living Untriggered, and it really just goes through these four different segments, weaving together all the pieces to 
to help people live an untriggered life. And is that is that a live course? It, it'll be live, and um, you know we have a whole curriculum for it, and we've done it for years. I, you know, it's really what came out of all the work that I did on my own life. That's great. When when is it? I think we've set up a. Oh, it's coming up. In October, November. Oh, okay. All right. And so, in terms of your of your um, of your live course, where is it? Where do you have the 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 courses? Uh, we do them online. I teach a lot nationally and internationally live courses, but the online courses are everywhere. We have people from around the world. And then- okay, so the course that you that you have coming up is going to be online, but live. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. So anybody from anywhere can sign up as long as they can get there at a time, you know, during I the time. Coaching along the way to help people really put it into practice. And okay. Sure. So, so there's the opportunity to work with you in terms of your, your online, uh, live courses. And then also there is an opportunity for live coaching, one-on-one coaching with you, kind of similar yeah, to what we're doing right now. People in the community who've done the course and really use the skills. So it gets more, you know, real. Right. So you have the community, you have a community of people who've gone through your courses and then they kind of self-coach each other and that sort of thing. Yeah. That, that's always really, really nice to see. And you have a quiz, right? We do the profile relationship profile. So can you just tell us a little bit about that? Sure. It's uh, dpay.com backslash profile. Well, we'll link it up. We'll link it up in the show notes. So we'll make sure that, that they can get to it from the show, but it's really looking at these different relationship profiles and what are the benefits and drawbacks because each of them has their benefit and drawback and just giving you more awareness so that you have more access to yourself. Yeah. And do the other steps to help you change the, the way you interact in the life that you have with yourself and with other people. So the self-discovery is like what your relationship type is and then how you're going to, how you can re- uh, interact with other people. Exactly. Oh, that's cool. Well, I think, I think I want to have you back. I think that, uh, Anytime, yeah, I'm probably thrilled to talk to you. It's great. Yeah, no, this is, this has been really good. I'm just really glad that you came and spoke to us today and I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to kind of delve into this a little bit more. I'm probably going to buy one of your books and try and read it with the, the 20 minutes. Okay. You. <laughs> See, you know, it's funny. I'm reading, um, I'm reading this book right now called self-directed behavior. Have you heard of that one? It's, a, it's another psychology textbook. I'm actually using it in my membership to, uh, help, uh, help the women do behavior change. And so I'm, I'm actually going through parts of it, like, you know, how to beat procrastination, how to change, you know, if you want to change some sort of behavior. And uh, it's a really fantastic book. And I've found that, that there's so many good nuggets in it that it's really good for, for my, my members who've gone through my course. Um, what? Self-directed behavior. But anyway, um, but so, so I'm, so this, this is a really good, uh, good book. And I think that, that I can use some of your, you know, if, you know, I read your books and probably use some of your techniques as well in the membership. I've, Definitely the BSC, the Becoming Safe in the Body. I'll send that out today. Get um, my team to send that to you. Sure. As well as the book. And they're so simple that for years I thought, what good does this do anyone? I know it changed my life and it's helping people. But the fact that that's what it is. And we think about it when I learned about attachment theory and think about guidance and mentoring. What that is all about is how do we scale something, take tiny steps so yeah. that somebody can the scaffolding inside. And that's what these skills do. It's a simple little thing. Well, you know, that goes back to constant, never ending improvement, right? And Kaizen, where you just want to get 1%, you know, what's, and then, you know, what, what our mentor Ryan said, likes to say is, you know, what's the next step that we can do right. that is so small that it's impossible to fail, Exactly. you know? And so, and so we get, we get, um, you know, we, we, you know, the whole idea is to get, to get to a point where, where, where we're in, in this space of constant, never ending improvement. I like to tell uh, people that, you know, that the women who follow me every Monday, I say, okay, what are you going to do this week? What are three things that you're going to do that's going to move you closer to your goal so that you are happening to your, to your week and to your day and to, you know, yeah. Yeah. So every, every week I do that so that, because, you know, one of the things that I think that, that, that it takes time for us to really understand is that our whole life happens here. Uh, you know, it, it may seem like it's happening out there, but everything out there is a dream and, and everything that, that really happens is what's happening in between our heads. And that's where we have control and we can change the narrative. We can change our stories. So if you don't like what's happening, if you don't like your life, if you're complaining a lot, what you can do is you can look at your stories and see, is that story serving me? 
And if it's not, then change it. There's a few things that we can't change. We can't change the fact that gravity sucks. We, <laughs> we can't change that. You know, it, it, things are going to fall at 9.8 meters per second squared. That's a, that's a universal law. But we also have universal laws like the law of attraction. And if we can get into the right vibratory space, anything that we want or need are, is going to come to us. That is another law. But we have to, you know, we have to take the steps that are, that's necessary. We have to do the work to get to that space. And that's, that's where, you know, I think like looking at attachment and, and um, looking at where we're triggered and things like that can really help us. So, right. and if you, cause if you don't do that, you're going to keep attracting the old stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, Esther Hicks likes to say, you know, you got to find out what you don't want. So you know what you do want. Right. That's, that's, um, that's what she likes to say. And, um, well, I don't love, I don't love Esther Hicks. I, I do. There's a couple of things she says that I, that I do like, but you know, for the most part, I'm still, I'm still very skeptical about, about channeling some sort of being. Um, <laughs> so, so I still have my own skepticisms as a scientist. Um, but anyway, I, I want to be mindful of time. So thank you, Deirdre, for, for coming on. Um, we're going to, we're going to hook up all of your, your books and, uh, your quiz in our show notes so that the, that the audience can go ahead and, and get involved. So I really appreciate you coming on today and, uh, we'll have you back hopefully soon. You're the best. All right. Thank thanks a lot. Job. All right. Did you know that menopause is not a medical condition? Most doctors don't know this either. I like to say that menopause is the privilege of a long life and to really take hold of our lives in menopause we have to unlearn what society and the medical establishment has told us about menopause. Thanks so much for being a part of the menopause movement.